is named after Jean Havens, who was a professor in the then Rural Sociology Department, renamed the Community and Environmental Sociology Department, a professor in the uh, Rural Sociology Department, uh, who died in 1984, and who exemplified a particular combination of progressive activism and high-level scholarship that the Haven Center hopes to promote. Our central mission is to bridge the divide between progressive activism and academic life around questions of social justice. Uh, previous recipients of our Lifetime Achievement Award are Noam Chomsky, Howard Zinn, Francis Fox Piven, Eduardo Galliano, and Barbara Aaron Reich. You can see that we have um, very ambitious cast of characters that we look, cast of characters that we like to have as part of our uh, what I think is a symbolic affirmation of the kind of values and perspectives which we hope to promote. Tariq Ali is a writer, historian, filmmaker, political activist, and public intellectual. For decades, he has been one of the leading voices on the international left. He is a member of the editorial committee of the New Left Review and Sin Permiso, and contributes to The Guardian, Counterpunch, and the London Review of Books. He is also author of many books, some of which include Conversations with Edward Said, Clash of Fundamentalisms, Crusades, Jihads, and Modernity, The Obama Syndrome, and The Extreme Center of Warning. Tariq's autobiography of the 60s, Street Fighting Years, was re-released by Verso this year. In it, he tells the story of how he became a leader of the anti-Vietnam War movement. It is a tale that takes us from Paris and Prague to Hanoi and Bolivia, encountering along the way Malcolm X, Bertrand Russell, Marlon Brando, Henry Kissinger, and Nick Jagger. <laughs> to me, I doubt if there will ever be a time in my life where I'll be able to read a sentence such as that again. <laughs> Tariq first became politically active in his teenage years, joining the movement against the military dictatorship in Pakistan. However, his parents were warned by an uncle in military intelligence that his activism was gaining the attention of the state. Tariq's parents decided to send him to England to study at Oxford, where he was elected president of the Oxford Union in 1965. The Oxford Union is a debating society, among other things. It is here that Tariq's public profile began to grow as he became a vociferous critic of the war in Vietnam. He engaged in a series of famous public debates with figures including Henry Kissinger and Michael Stewart and led protesters to the American Embassy in London in 1968 in which he has become one of the most iconic, which has become one of the most iconic protests in British history. Indeed, Tariq is said to be the alleged inspiration for the Rolling Stones song, Street Fighting Man, which was written about him at this demonstration. And the John Lennon song, Power to the People, is reputedly based on a conversation and interview between the two of them. That's another pair of sentences I am likely to match in any introduction in the future. Active in the New Left of the 1960s, Tariq has long been associated with the journal New Left Review, and he was also an editor of the Black Wharf newspaper, uh, the Black Wharf newspaper. During this time, when Tariq was intimately involved in radical politics, he befriended figures including Malcolm X, Stokely Carmichael, John Lennon, and Yoko Ono. He even has connections with Che Guevara. When Guevara was caught and assassinated in the jungle in Bolivia in 1967, Tariq was only a few miles away in Kamiri, observing the trial of Regis Debray, where Tariq was also briefly accused of being a Cuban revolutionary. And Tariq's politics are not just a thing of the past. He has remained a prominent critic of neoliberal economic policies for decades and was present at the 2005 World Social Forum in Porto Alegre, Brazil, where he was one of 19 figures to sign the Porto Alegre Manifesto. 
And when the U.S. and Britain invaded Iraq and Afghanistan, Tariq again became a leading voice in the international anti-war movement. He not only played a role as a prominent spokesman for the anti-war movement, but also aim, aimed to add intellectual clarity to the geopolitical conflict in the region. His book, Clash of Fundamentalisms, places the events of September 11th in historical perspective. And his book, Bush in Babylon, intellectually demolishes the new conservative case for war. In short, wherever and whenever there has been injustice in the world, Tariq Ali has tried to fight that injustice. Unafraid to court controversy, he has done so with vitality, the vitality of a true public intellectual. Today, on the 50th anniversary year of 1968, he is here to reflect on the radical politics of the 1960s. I'm sure there will be many valuable lessons for politics today. Please join me in giving a big welcome to Tariq Ali. the natural segue between enthusiastic applause at the beginning of a talk. I forgot any respectable award has a attractive plaque to go with it. <laughs> so I give you a plaque in honor of uh, your Lifetime Achievement Award from the A.E. Havens Center for Social Justice. Thanks very much for all those uh, uh, kind words, uh, Eric, and thank you very much for the uh, award. Uh, I'm very honored uh, to be in such good company, uh, and I'm very grateful. Thank you. Before I carry on, I would just like to tell you, I, just as I was walking down, I developed a nosebleed, which has never happened to me before. I hope it's got nothing to do with the award. <laughs> <coughs> A bad omen. Uh, so if you see me dabbing my nose, it's because of that and nothing else. Otherwise, I'm feeling fine, thanks. Mm -hmm. um, two things need to be said about 68. But before I come to them, I really would like to start by paying enormous tribute to the school students who are marching in the streets of the United States today. Yes. I mean, it's unprecedented, this scale and degree of mobilization against the NRA and everything its organizers stand for and the politicians from both mainstream parties who have carried on uh, defending uh, uh, the NRA over the years. So may the school students carry on this struggle and may they leave something behind so that the generations that follow them also know what to do when the time comes. Hopefully by that this law will be ended and the amendment altered, but we never know in this country. People get excited, people do things, and then 10 years later the same things are happening again, mm -hmm. as is the case with the wars in the Middle East. And congratulations also to the young university students in France who are occupying a number of universities uh, with their own struggles in mind and who have been attacked by the far-right and semi-fascist forces in Montpellier and other parts of France. And I loved in particular a slogan they chalked up on the walls of Paris, which said, others are commemorating 1968, we're restarting it. <laughs> the two important points that need to be made when we're discussing 1968 today, the first is that we're living now in very different times. And the echoes of 1968, which the French, young French students perceive, are that, echoes. Echoes of an important struggle uh, that was waged in very different times. Times of hope, 
times when people not simply believed but thought they could defeat power and a time when the big inspiration that began what we know as the 60s was the heroic decision of the Vietnamese people and their organizations not to give up. They had fought the Japanese, they had fought the French, and now the Americans were trying to colonize them and they were determined not to give up. And they didn't. And it was their historical an epic struggle against the world's mightiest, largest, most powerful nation in the world that inspired a whole generation. Not just in the United States, which it did, but all <coughs> over the world, in Europe, in Africa, in South America, continent after continent, people, this struggle shown every night on national television, was etched in the memory and the minds of those young people who were watching. So that when the French general strike erupted in May 68, the largest strike in the history of capitalism, with 10 million workers on strike or occupying their factories and demanding radical change, the students renamed the historic streets of Paris during this occupation. And one of the streets renamed in the Latin Quarter was, was called the Street of Heroic Vietnam. And we tend, those of us from the generations that followed, to forget the role that war played. And added to that role, I have to add, because this is also increasingly forgotten, is the birth of the anti-war movement in the United States of America, its growth, its development, its challenge to the holders of power in the White House, in the State Department, in the Pentagon, and at a later stage, once this movement had begun, the emergence of the GIs against the war, uniformed soldiers of the empire, many retired, many ill, many disabled, <coughs> with their purple hearts and an array of medals across their chests, marching outside the Pentagon in 72 and declaring that they wanted the Vietnamese to win. Now that was an act of internationalism that has, read, that has no equivalent in, the, in imperial history, old or present. And so we should not forget those valiant soldiers who decided that truth was more important than carrying out orders. And that too had an enormous impact on the world. Many young people thought if the American GIs are against the war, there must be something terribly wrong with it, and began to think. And African Americans in many cases were in the lead. Many of the riots that took place in US cities in 68, when the odd sniper was discovered and caught and taken to prison, they discovered he was an ex-GI who fought in Vietnam. And the slogan the African-American GIs used to chant was, I am going to Vietnam because Vietnam is where I am. Hell no, I ain't gonna go. At big conferences in uh, European cities and elsewhere. So 68 taught the world internationalism. It was a global struggle and a global strike against war that we've ever seen, the most important that we'd ever seen. Now, I spent six weeks in North Vietnam in 1966-67, uh, when two of Europe's greatest philosophers, Bertrand Russell in Britain and Jean-Paul Sartre in France, decided to set up a war crimes tribunal to arraign the US government for war crimes. There was no other such existing body at the time. The US were asked to send people to defend themselves. And I was sent to North Vietnam by this tribunal 
for evidence. So for six weeks we traveled. We couldn't travel during the day, we traveled at night so that the bombers wouldn't get us. Because the bombardments were so heavy. And you know, you saw everything you were told was happening but hadn't wanted to believe. Dead children, maimed civilians, special bombs called the guava and the pineapple, devised to hurt and strike at civilians. And that six weeks, I think, transformed me for life. Because I felt that a system which can do this to a country which has no desire to attack it or damage it in any way, but a system that can do this simply to assert its hegemony in the world and to show that it is the most powerful country and to destroy any hope of social change this system, whether in the United States or amongst its allies, though they were few and far between at that time on this particular war, needs to be changed. And it was from Vietnam and what was being done to Vietnam that it occurred to us that we had to try and do the same in different ways and destroy capitalism. That was the overwhelming desire on the part of people not just to demand reforms, but to say the system has got to go. And if you look at the slogans that were chanted in those times, that is what they were. Optimistic beyond belief, exaggerated, angry, but demanding a new system, a new social system. I say that because the world today is very different. If those were periods, if those were, if the 20th century was an epoch of revolutions, and there, were, there had been many since 1917. The 1917, followed by upheavals and strikes in Hungary, in Germany, the crushing of the German revolution by the most extreme wing of the German militarists, which later paved the way for the Third Reich. Had the German revolution won, there would have been no Third Reich. And there would have been no atrocities on that particular scale, including the Judeo side. But those who backed the German rulers to win also gave us Hitler. Then moving out of Europe, we saw an astonishing 20-year struggle between the radical anti-capitalists in the Chinese Communist Party against nationalists led by the Kuomintang. And this revolution finally succeeded in 1949. Its anniversary will be marked next year, in 2019. And together, the Russian and the Chinese revolutions, different though they were, took two of the largest countries of the world outside the capitalist world market. Now, Whatever mistakes, whatever atrocities were committed in these countries by their rulers, we know. But leaving them aside for the moment, it was a huge triumph against capital, global capital. And they knew it. And the United States, Woodrow Wilson much proclaimed as a peacemaker, had set up a committee at the highest levels of the state whose aim was to topple the Bolsheviks from April 1917 onwards. This committee was set up. And this committee included two men who were to play a huge role in the Cold War to come, the Dulles brothers. One became head of the intelligence network and the other later became a secretary of state. And the, the stage was set to defeat what was happening, and that they didn't give up till the Soviet system imploded, largely through the fault of its own rulers, it has to be said. And it's worth bearing in mind that it did not require any armed intervention <coughs> to defeat the Soviet Union. People who, it happened from within, 
It happened because there were people who from 1956 onwards had wanted change, had wanted reform. And one of the tragedies of 1968, but also a heroic struggle, was the struggle waged by the reform communists of Czechoslovakia, whose leader, Alexander Dubček, General Secretary of the party, decided on a reform program in April 1968. And the aim of the program was to democratize Czechoslovakia. And it was called even by a hostile Western media, Dubček's phrase resounded, what we want is socialism with a human face. And in that period, from April to August 1968, I would say that Czechoslovakia was probably the freest country in the world in relation to its media and in relation to what would be published and in relation to the debates that were taking place, defining socialism, what does socialism consist of? Does socialism simply meaning nationalizing anything that moves? No, this has been a failure, they said. It doesn't mean that. It means implementing democratic values so that the name of socialism and communism tarred for so long can begin to be cleansed of all the rubbish which may have been necessary, it may not have been. And this experiment began to seep into the rest of Eastern Europe. And it was when Czech printing workers, who decided that their magazines could be infiltrated into the Soviet Union, and they started with the Ukraine, but they were spreading, that the Politburo of the Soviet Union decided to intervene and end the Czech experiment. And that was, they didn't know it then, but that was actually the end of the Soviet Union itself. Why? Because they lost their own intelligentsia. The intelligentsia in Russia has played a huge part over the last three centuries, till now, two centuries, in the forefront of struggle against tyranny. And in the case of Russia itself, many didn't support the Bolsheviks. Some did, but all hoped that reforms would come. And Khrushchev's speech in 56, denouncing the crimes of Stalin, created this hope yet again. But when Brezhnev invaded Czechoslovakia in 1968 and crushed the movement, it's very interesting what happened. Again, forgot. The first wave of Soviet soldiers, Red Army soldiers who went in, were greeted with open arms by the Czechs and they said, why are you here? These conversations were staggering. And the Russians, because they could understand each other's languages, Slav land, the Russians replied, because we are told you are counter-revolution. They said, we are counter-revolutionaries. We are carrying the red flag. We are carrying portraits of Marx and Lenin. We are counter-revolutionaries. Or are you? And the soldiers refused to open fire. And the entire first wave had to be sent back. And more pliable soldiers found in order to continue the disgraceful and appalling invasion of that country. And you know something, a writer, a conservative writer, like Alexander Solzhenitsyn, later awarded the Nobel Prize, later wrote, or he, you know, he didn't write, he was in a, answering a question, who said, when did the Soviet Union die for you, Mr. Solzhenitsyn? And Solzhenitsyn said, it died for me on the 21st of August 1968 when our troops went and crushed socialism with a human face in Czechoslovakia because then I realized that if they were doing this to Czechoslovakia, we would never get reforms from below. And I gave up. And that applied to lots of other people as well. And that was a huge defeat for the left. And the triumphs, of course, were the enormous victories of the Vietnamese, helped by the anti-war movement in the United States. And the whole of Western Europe was up in arms uh, to, to see what could be done to help the Vietnamese, to accelerate the struggle at home, etc., etc. And then, leaving aside Europe and America, 
you had a situation in Mexico where there were the Summer Olympics. The famous image we now remember is of two African-American athletes raising the black bar salute, as it's called, but it's the old red salute of the Communist International. Like this in solidarity with people fighting everywhere because they had been told the minute they arrived in Mexico that there'd been a massacre the week before the Olympics in which over 300 Mexican students had been massacred, killed, destroyed in a big square. These were the conditions in which uh, the, these uh, wretched Olympics uh, uh, took place. So it makes me smile when I hear of countries being boycotted uh, over Olympics, winter and summer ones, for crimes which don't even measure up to one quarter of what was done in Mexico uh, uh, at that time. And the big triumph, of course, of the movements came in Pakistan. Now, I was speaking in France uh, three or four weeks ago <coughs> on 68 with French people. And I said to them, just from the audience, I said, how many of you, and there are about four or five hundred people there, how many of you remember anything happening in a country like Pakistan? I said, did you hear what happened in Pakistan in 68? And about four people raised their hands whose hair was as white as mine. Uh, <coughs> the young didn't know. So I told them what happened, is that in November, 1968, a student movement developed in Pakistan, which spread rapidly over the next four weeks to the whole country. They were shot, they were bait and charged, they were tear gassed, and they carried on. And as they carried on, more and more people from different social layers came and joined them. Virtually every social layer. Junior civil servants, Young army officers said they were not going to open fire on these demonstrations anymore. That was the beginning of the end for the military dictatorship. Workers, sections of the peasantry, prostitutes came out, openly admitting who they were and saying, we are with you. Medical students, doctors, the hospitals were empty. It was a huge social explosion. And Eric uh, Olin Wright, a dear old comrade, asked me a question over dinner, which we got distracted by something else, but now I will answer it, which is religion, <coughs> and how deep it goes, and how does it emerge? And is it not the case that in some cases it goes so deep that there is no real explanation, or perhaps there is, but what is it? Well, I want to demonstrate, I want to reply with a reference to Pakistan. In all these demonstrations, and I spoke in the last month, I went to Pakistan, I was invited by the student committees and uh, spent about a month traveling the whole country, speaking with these students. Not a single religious slogan, not one. The right-wing jamaat e islami would shout, you know, what does Pakistan mean? And they would give their reply, La ilaha illallah, there is only one God. Or Allahu Akbar, God is great. To which our side, in the vast majority, would raise the same question and say, what does Pakistan mean? And the crowds would chant, food, clothing, and shelter. A direct clash with the religious parties. They actually tried to provoke me into doing something stupid, which I didn't do. But a group of religious students came up before one of my talks and said, uh, Brother Tariq, very polite, we want to present you with a small copy of a very important work. And it was a, a small copy of the Holy Quran. They were hoping I'd fling it on the ground, but you know, I'm not completely dumb. So uh, I said, thank you very much for this work. I look forward to reading it. And the crowd roared with laughter. <laughs> so the religious groups 
were completely and totally isolated backing the dictatorship, which is what they did. We outmaneuvered them on every single level. It was only later when the fruits of the movement had been squandered by many of its leaders, when Pakistan had split up, when no alternative was left, that some people began to drift off to religion as an alternative. And it is also true that a number of radical leaders from Lahore and Karachi were so alienated from what had happened after our victory that they joined the Jamaat Islami, became some of its leaders of its youth, exactly the same process in Egypt, exactly the same process in Algeria. Feeling desperate, feeling we hadn't achieved what had been promised by Nasser in Egypt, by the movement in Pakistan, by the liberation struggle in Algeria. Not in huge numbers, but quite key people moved. And for them it was a way of doing politics differently. And they did it, but it wasn't preordained that it would be like this. So 68 was a mixed bag, but the important thing is that it took place in a context, as I said earlier, in which victories seemed possible. That's the big difference with today. I mean, I don't want to be too extreme on this, but I would say that the period that opened up after the big triumph of capital, the complete collapse of the Soviet Union and that whole world, despite all its weaknesses, was seen by multi-million masses in different continents as the end, not just by intellectuals. They said if they couldn't succeed, what, what's going to happen to us? And they, of course, the triumphalism and euphoria exhibited by this country and its leaders. We've won. It's our victory. That is it. Uh, indicated that what was taking place, in fact, was a counter-revolution. And in many of these Eastern European countries, the people who ultimately came to power, and many of whom are in power today, are people who were aligned in one shape or another with the Third Reich during the Second World War. The Hungarians, Portiites, the Croatians, its right-wing politicians, fought against the resistance movement led by uh, Tito, and these groups have re-emerged and are re-emerging, as they are in parts of Western Europe, by the way. I mean, if you look at Italy, uh, many say that there are some cities where it's impossible to criticize Mussolini because he's very popular, because it's a right-wing city. In Germany, too, there are ominous signs. Nothing to be very worried about, but ominous signs of a shift to the right. So we live in a period where the counter-revolution has triumphed. And what does that mean? That means that... <clears throat> they're going to kill anyone or anything that tries to seriously challenge the system as a whole. That's what it means. And they do it already in South America. So what has now become possible is what many of us used to mock in the 60s and 70s, which is some decent form of social democracy that ends austerity, that ends uh, the neoliberal system, that reintroduces a large social safety net for a majority of the population, that puts back into motion those ideas which neoliberalism destroyed. It's interesting that neoliberalism, in this case like the Third Reich, developed its own vocabulary and its own language and its own ways of speaking. Like everything regressive that was done, like massive privatizations, like public-private deals which basically put the hospitals, mortgaged the hospitals to moneylenders for a long, long time to come. 
All these were presented as reforms. And those who said, like I did, constantly, that they are not reforms, they are regressions, were called dinosaurs. Well, that too I didn't object to, because as I pointed out on a number of occasions, dinosaurs are very popular with the youngest generation. <laughs> <laughs> they build museums for them. Kids go and see them, so there must be some reason for this. <clears throat> so fine, I said, you can call us dinosaurs, but you know, it's pointless behaving there. Try and answer our arguments. Why are you doing this? It's not going to work. That was our principal argument. It is not going to work, and it is going to concentrate wealth at the very top and leave the rest, not if not to starve, in poor conditions. And that is what has happened in country after country. And so, after the 2008 Wall Street crash, we saw a turn. People, not, if not challenging in the system, challenging this particular variant of the system and new movements erupted, social movements, in a number of European countries, and to a certain extent in the United States, and most dramatically in South America, where they said we are going to use the wealth we have or the wealth we create to benefit the poor. And in South America they began to do it. And an enormous campaign began against the South America. I mean, if you look at what the press was writing about Venezuela soon after Chavez's victories, it was exactly the same. You could read the same text in the New York Times, slightly different in the London Guardian, in El País, in Spain, etc. Uh, why they wasted so much money sending so many different journalists when one would have sufficed, I don't know. <laughs> That crash was the beginning of a huge question mark. This system which they told us, and what they called globalization, which was going to transform our lives, decrease disparities, offer everyone a chance, trickle down economics, all this, they said, uh, didn't happen. Instead, we've nearly seen the system go under. And in, when the system, the financial capitalist system, was close to collapse, what did they do? They did everything that we were told was forbidden to the left, to social democrats. Why should the state help you, they used to say. Everything has to be self-sufficient. The state can't help you. When these scoundrels basically through their policies crashed, what did they do? They went on their knees and said, dear state, please help us. And the state spent trillions of dollars in bailing them out. It would have been much, much better if they hadn't bailed all of them out. If they'd let some of these banks go under simply protecting the small account holders in these outfits not those who were using this for speculation, might have cleansed the system somewhat. No. They carried on as before. And carrying on as before meant that it was a return to the status quo. It's what I call described that as a result of this, and even prior to it, an extreme center had emerged at the center of European politics. By the extreme center, I mean the center-left and center-right parties which alternate in government and may be different on certain cultural questions, but on the central issues of the day, carry out the same policies. It's the same here. They, in fact, they learned it from the United States, which is very hegemonic now in Europe, not just politically, in politics, but in culture. And just as a footnote here, the, the most amazing films and documentaries that were produced in Italy, France, Germany, the Scandinavian countries from the 50s to the early 80s have collapsed, gone. What every single American director, uh, French, German director, not every single, there are a few good people, but by and large they want to mimic Hollywood. 
So Hollywood specializes in crime movies. We'll do our version of crime movies. The pattern is now exactly the same, because some do them better than others. The New York Times bestseller list is immediately translated into these languages and publishers, eyes shut in some cases, decide what to publish on the basis of what is selling well in the United States, which is often a lot of crime. So it's this situation, this is the globalization that has actually strengthened the US hegemony uh, uh, in Europe. And it is this which I call the extreme center, globally and in these countries, where you can elect whoever you like. Not all that much changes. Let me be a bit provocative. I mean, Trump is, you know, desperate publicity seeker who says the most appalling things to be at the center of attention globally and in this country. <coughs> the things he promised, which won him some support, were that he would clear the swamp of Wall Street, clean out the mess, that he would stop these wasteful wars going on, etc. What's changed? The swamp runs through the White House as it always did. Trump is busy fighting wars, threatening new ones, ap appointing people whose sanity really should be questioned. I'm referring here to John Bolt. <laughs> I mean, he, no, no, I'm not joking. I think he really needs psychiatric help. <laughs> this is a guy who's threatening war against North Korea, Iran, who's got an appalling record in South America, and he's been plucked out of nowhere and put in charge on some issue, things again. So, <clears throat> but in general, the basic trend of U.S. economic policy, economic policy, and military policy, imperial policy, till now, has not changed that much. And I shudder to think what's going to happen if Trump tries to use the law Obama passed when he was president, which gives the U.S. president the right to order the death, the execution of any U.S. citizen in the US or abroad, if such a citizen is deemed a threat to national security. Now, Obama killed about four or five people. Uh, you know, what this means is no recourse to justice of any sort, no due process. But, you know, Trump could wreak havoc with it if he wanted to. I'm not saying he will because he changes his mind all the time, but it's not impossible. So a lot of what was done in the past is still being continued. Now, obviously, on cultural and uh, social policies, uh, on matters such as abortion, gay rights, etc., not to talk about uh, the rights of uh, the African-American community, mean that the thing which, which Trump has done openly and publicly is what was never done in this fashion in public before, uh, is basically encourage white supremacist attitudes in the country again, legalize them, saying it's fine, you can say that, not a huge problem without denouncing them. Now, if you go back and read the Nixon, or look at, listen to the Nixon tapes, if you can't sleep one night and want something, do and avoid Netflix, but just binge watch the Nixon tapes. <laughs> and you will see Nixon coming up with all sorts of racist and anti-Semitic arguments. It's quite shocking. No different from Trump. Trump hasn't gone down the anti-Semitic road. But there is a, 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 a surprising continuity in US politics. And this is now the method being followed in Europe as well. And that is, of course, uh, deeply, deeply uh, uh, worrying. It's not always the case that this is happening. I mean, we had a politician in the United States who didn't win the primaries, or for whatever reason, let's not get into that, Bernie Sanders, 
who excited young people and older people to and promise social democratic reforms if he were to win. And he might have won, we don't know, we'll never know now, <laughs> against Trump. And he was maligned out of existence virtually. But he has left behind a legacy of large numbers of young people who want radical change. And that's his, that'll be, if he's remembered in the future, it will be for that, that he offered some hope to people. And in Britain, we have Jeremy Corbyn, who's gone one step beyond Trump, uh, beyond Sanders, and won over the leadership of the Labour Party, and is now slowly trying to transform this party into an instrument for serious social democratic reforms. He's also very radical on foreign policy. So he came within a whisker of winning. And he might well win the next elections. It wouldn't be easy because the knives are out for him. But he is going to try. So it's not, you know, one cannot say that today's world is hopeless in that sense. People haven't given up the struggle as we see in this country, as we see in other parts of the world. But their aims are not what they used to be in the 60s, and quite honestly, that's fine, as far as I'm concerned. I would be much, much unhappier if there were no struggles at all, and tiny groups of people belonging to tiny sects would sit and say something that is totally pure, in which you know we could all applaud. That's not politics. That's effectively denying realities. And so when I read that the DSA, an organization which was more or less moribund, defunct, has revived and has 30,000 members, I am pleased, because it's quite large. Not that large for the states, and not large at all compared to the half a million new members that joined the British Labour Party after Corbyn's victory. Half a million making Labour the largest <coughs> political party in Europe. But it's still not unimportant, unimportant. So this is going to be a lengthy, slow, sometimes quicker uh, uh, process. But the struggle uh, uh, will continue. New spaces will open up. And the one thing <clears throat> I have learned over the last 50 years is that one must not give up. You know, that's the worst possible thing, is to give up because things seem bad. To fight back, one has to fight back with every means possible for those who, for a variety of reasons, cannot fight back. They cannot fight back because they're refugees. And they might be killed, or they might be dumped in the Mediterranean Sea, or they might be thrown out of windows as accidents. So in this situation, we have to fight back and carry on and help those who are fighting back and speak on behalf of those who can't. Thank you very much. questions from the floor. Uh, we do not have a roving mic. As you can see from the lighting in this room, uh, there's a certain technological failure at the University of Wisconsin for this particular facility. So if you're going to ask a question, I ask that you speak up with a booming vi voice or come up here and use this mic uh, so that people can hear the question. Uh, yes. Um. You talked about um, how 1968 ended with the forces of reaction firmly in control in a lot of places. What lessons can we learn from 68 about how to pursue progressive action to avoid such a result this time around? Did you hear the question? 
at the back. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. The, the, the question was, what lessons can we learn from some of the setbacks of 68? Well, you know, if the whole history of the last two centuries in the world, as far as our side is concerned, has been a history of setbacks. Think about it. All the times we have lost, and yet people have arisen again to try and change things. I mean, one of the most exciting developments <coughs> in the 19th century, political developments in the 19th century, was the Paris Commune. Why? Because the Parisians fought back, both against the Prussians and against the Versailles, Versailles their own reactionaries. And in order to fight back, created the beginnings of a system which meant that each quarter in France elected, elected its own representatives to the commune, that painters, people in different occupations, decided in different quarters, led by Gustave Courbet, the great, great uh, radical painter of his time, on what paintings were needed, what they would paint, how they would put them up. It, it was utopian, but it was a very practical utopia. And in his last uh, book, Unfinished, Lenin in State and Revolution, constantly referred to the model of the Paris Commune. <coughs> that this is the model we have to embrace. And then again in his last writings as well. But it was too late by that time. You know, too much had happened and the Civil War had virtually destroyed Russia. Uh, and it's worth remembering that most of the workers who made that revolution had died in the Civil War. So you had a completely new layer which had come in, not so politicized, joined factories in times of defeat, etc., etc. <coughs> I'm not going to go into that. So I have to be honest with you. It's very difficult to say what lesson we can learn from defeats because these defeats occur in different times, in different circumstances, in different contexts. All we need, we need to have a world or countries or small states or large states who learn to trust their people, work with them, consult them on the best possible basis <coughs> of, of democracy to see what can be done, what is possible. Will we be able to do that? I don't know. There are no certainties left in this world any longer. And it's stupid constantly to think in the terms of the first half of the 20th century, in terms of what is the revolutionary subject. Because the deindustrializations that have taken place under neoliberalism, whether intended or not, their consequences have been virtually to destroy all the big industrial unions apart from the car workers and the railway workers. Most of the big industrial unions have been wrecked. So what shape is an upheaval going to take? How is it going to move forward? Is it going to be a struggle via the nationalities as Scotland and Catalonia have shown in Europe for some time? We do not know. But anything that is positive and progressive moves forward should be supported. It would be crazy for groups, small groups in particular, but big groups too, to put their own narrow interests about those of the movement as a whole. I mean, I think, just to give you, and you know, we think modestly now, but just to give you an example, I think if a political organization or movement or whatever you call it emerged in the United States from the Sanders mobilization, and had a membership of 100, 150,000 people, that would be a huge step forward for the American left and progressive people in this country. A huge step forward. So that's how we have to think. There are no clear cut answers. You know, we do this, we do that, we quote Lenin, we quote Marx. It's foolish to carry on that way. We must learn from all these giants of the past. But we live in a very different world in some Yes. 
So I am entering that very uh, different world as a recent. Sorry. Person. I'm entering that. Why, why don't you? I, oh, of course. What, yeah. I, what I would suggest is uh, I'll call on people and then scamper up here <laughs> and speak into the microphone. Fair enough. Thank you. <laughs> and, and speak close to it so you can. Of course, we're having a private conversation. <laughs> Uh, so I'm entering that very different world as a recently enfranchised citizen, uh, a part of a citizen body that seems to be reacting negatively to the progress that you spoke of in the previous century. What sort of action, because I believe this is an award that, uh, for fusing your theory with action, what action would you suggest for a young person such as myself moving forward? Well, I, uh, you know where... Uh, it would have to, you live in, which part of the states do you live in? <laughs> These parts of the states. These parts of the states. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, you know, the, it's a strange business, the states, because its constitution laws are irregular uh, and often discourage people from participating in elections. I mean, if you study them closely, that is uh, 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 what emerges. But, I mean, my advice today to someone like you who wants to think, experiment, etc., is to see what the DSA has to offer, really. I mean, I would just do it. If you don't like it, quit. But at least go in there to see what is being offered, what the level of debates are, uh, and uh, uh, what could be done. I mean, I'm in one of those who does believe that electoral interventions are necessary. Uh, I think Seattle is a good model for what is possible sometimes, and I think to write off all this is wrong. I would love it if there were, you know, three or four, let's be modest, socialist senators and 10 or 15 Congress persons who are on the left. At least you have something in there. Even one person can do quite a lot. And we shall see uh, if this is going to be possible in the United States or whether electoral representation is going to be confined to those who belong to the big parties and those who just need money and cannot function without money. So that, that would be my advice here in the present circumstances, apart, of course, from helping the movements who are struggling for sing on single issues, campaigns of their own, Black Lives Matter, uh, the school students campaign against the NRA, etc. But I would, you know, suggest there's no harm in giving the DSA a go. So, do you mind if I ask a follow-up no, question? No, no, no. Okay. Um, so, as far as electoral intervention is concerned, especially in the United States, do you think it's to the advantage of somebody who lives in a state like Wisconsin um, to vote for third-party candidates? Is that a possibility at the state level, at the uh, national level, or even as far as the presidency is concerned? Well, it depends, you know. What you, you have to speak up, too. Uh, it depends. <laughs> it depends on what the third party is, what it's offering, but it's better than nothing. Uh, I know lots of people abstained in the last presidential elections. Quite a few Democrats didn't go out and vote because they didn't like their own candidate. I mean, currently, liberals are sort of... Uh, saying they only lost because of uh, Vladimir Putin uh, and not looking at the mirror. And that, I think, is uh, unfortunate because it miseducates people. But I think these things, you have to decide that these are tactics which have to be determined locally. And coming from London, I can't give you a sort of <laughs> concrete advice on that, but it's that sort of thing that... Uh, has to be considered. I mean, the other thing worth bearing in mind is lots of people are saying, probably correctly, that we should have a, a one-person, one-vote electoral system for the presidency, which instinctively one thinks is correct. But there is another side to it, that were that to happen effectively, the West Coast and the East Coast would decide. Quite a lot of states in between. Not matter at all and would, in that sense, not be visited by candidates or politicians, which might be a good thing you put them <laughs> yeah. But that's, 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 that's all, really. Well, thank to you. Think about it. Okay, all the best. <laughs> I'm, scanning, I'm scanning the room for diversity of, of speakers. 
There's not very many hands up. Okay. Old people. Call on old people. <laughs> I, want, I want young people and I'd like some women to raise their hands. Oh. Sir, could you reflect on social media such as tweets and posts on Facebook and what they are doing to politics? What would 1968 have been like if people had been tweeting, if Nixon had been tweeting? <laughs> if we had the social networks in 68, sure. we'd have had a lot more fun. <laughs> that I can promise you, uh, because it was a nightmare uh, uh, meeting up with uh, people you wanted to hang out with or go out with. You know, uh, uh, the f you couldn't even leave messages on the phone in those days. They'd be handwritten and delivered carefully, etc., etc. Uh, so it would have transformed that and. I, I do think about this quite often, that in terms of mobilizing for demonstrations, we would have probably doubled or trebled the size of our demonstrations if we'd had those networks, without any doubt at all. I mean, we got 100,000 people against the Vietnam War in October 68, and we thought this was great, and everyone thought, God, 100,000 people. But in the same city, we mobilized a million people against the war in Iraq. And the big, big change was the uh, social networks. People mobilized in every possible way. We were amazed when a million people turned up. That's the difference. Yeah. I said, Carrick, I ask you this as someone who was a radical. 18 years old in 1968 and found in you one of my earliest inspirations. It would seem kind of sad now that we've been reduced to you know, hoping for a revival of social democracy and some taming of some of the worst aspects of, of, of neo-capitalism. But my question is this, if a new New Deal is not in the cards, if for various reasons the capitalist ruling class isn't going to allow for a new New Deal, don't we need to develop another, stra a, another a new radical strategy independent of liberalism and social democracy in order to position ourselves for when capitalism in this country through economic and ecological uh, collapse, you know, throws this country into crisis, throws Europe into crisis, and, and offers us a new opportunity to revive the, 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 the spirit of 1968. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> why go back to 68, man? Because nothing much happened on that level then. Let's go back then if we really want to go back to 1917. Okay. Right now. And uh, <laughs> yeah, it's right on, but it's, it's not related to the world as it exists today. I mean, I would be the first person to be behind the barricades if there was any chance of a revolution anywhere. But all I notice is that when movements arise, social <coughs> movements, which create political movements, the most they can do is some form of social democracy. They haven't got the confidence or they feel it's impossible to make a revolution like the Cubans did or the Chinese did or the Russians did or the Vietnamese did. They feel they can't do it. And the reason they feel that is because they know that the system is strong and they will be probably could not get much popular support. You can't make those revolutions without popular support. That's the reason. It's not that I've become a, a social democrat. I'm just saying what is happening and why it is happening and why being sectarian to these sort of new social democratic style sui generis movements is foolish because you have nothing else to offer them except saying Let's go for it. But you know, if you and I go for it, nothing much is going to change. I wish it was the opposite, but it, it's just a fact at the moment. And in fact, getting left social democratic government increased the space massively to discuss many, many other possibilities, including moving forward. That you shouldn't give up on. Until 2008, people had given up on anything. Nothing was possible, more or less. That situation is now changed with what we are seeing both in Europe and North America. And 
that's what should be borne in mind. Um, yes, uh, first, back right there. Yeah. Me? You. Yeah. Okay, so you speak about how um, students who are in the streets are an inspiration protesting, but how can you say that and support Chavez and Maduro when hundreds of student protesters in Venezuela are killed by Venezuelan authorities? And how can you also support those dictators when people in their country are dying of malnutrition? Nine out of ten people hurt homes in Venezuela can't afford basic necessities such as food and water. Um. You were celebrating protests by young people and students here, but you were also supporting Chavez and Maduro, who have been repressing students and others' protests. Well, look, let me tell you something. Speak, about speak, speak. Uh, <clears throat> the movement which brought Chavez to power was a historic movement, which came to power because it struggled against neoliberalism atrocities. Thousands of people died in the Caracaso when workers and others went out on the streets to protest what? The cancellation of government subsidies on food and transport under the instructions of the International Monetary Fund. That is what triggered off that thing. And that was done by the oligarchic uh, 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 parties. So that's the first answer, that that is what created the whole Bolivarian movement by giving it victories. Chavez won victory after victory in that country. Uh, the second thing is this. During the Chavez period, the big attempts that were made to topple him were made by who? Right-wing political parties backed by the U.S. Embassy and backed by the old university system, which was largely limited to the kids of middle and upper middle class people. Very noticeable thing about uh, Venezuela, because I've been there several times, was both the class divide and the color divide. And the racial divide was very strong. Chavez was constantly being attacked as a monkey. They had a celebration once with the opposition parties in the US Embassy, where monkeys would, actual monkeys were brought in and labeled Chavistas till Colin Powell, the African-American Secretary of State in D.C., told them off and said this behavior is un unacceptable. So it wasn't just any old people who were in the movement against him. It was people who couldn't tolerate the fact that power had been taken away from them for some time. That's why I supported Chavez, and I'm very, very proud of uh, of having done so. I've, you know, if you want to study this question in greater detail, my books, Pirates of the Caribbean, on the South American upheavals, has chapter and verse of what happened in, in uh, uh, Venezuela. My statistic was actually from 2017 that hundreds of students were killed by the Venezuelan authorities. So about the current regime, not uh, By, by uh, yeah, Maduro. Yeah. yeah, it's extreme. I mean, I don't support that, obviously. But nor do I support the participation of some students and many opposition groups in the march on the hospital and setting alight a gynecological unit of that hospital on fire because it was a hospital set up by the government. So you have to bear in mind what is going on in Venezuela. It's not that they are neutrals anymore. It's a deeply divided country. And both sides carry out activities which are unsupportable. Yeah, you had your yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I wanted to, to change the uh, discussion to the Middle East and get your take on what's going on yeah. in Israel and Gaza right now. And, and also maybe uh, uh, just an example of what's in the headlines today about what the Trump administration has just um, taken a stance on in terms of this uh, lawsuit uh, against the PLO, uh, where he's urging the U.S. Supreme Court to rule um, uh, against those who are suing the PLO over terrorist, um, uh, trying to get damages from the PLO for, for, for terrorist activities in the past. Uh, but anything that you would have to say about what's happening in Israel right now and, and in Gaza and 
in the context of well, look, I'll have to be very brief because yeah. you know, as you know, this is a, a, a huge question and it's late. But uh, uh, effectively, the Israeli government since Oslo, since the Oslo Accords, <coughs> have not given an inch. This is now accepted. And the PLO made, in my opinion, as the late Edward Said argued, a huge mistake in capitulating at the uh, time of Oslo. And we are paying the price that the Israeli governments have moved regularly to the right. The fact that Netanyahu can be even regarded as a moderate or rational leader beckles the imagination. Many people in Israel don't see him like that. Leave alone Palestine and the other parts of the Arab world. It's only in the United States where the media and the entire political system is so geared to Israel that they gave him, that Israel has been given a bill, a blank check by the Senate and the Congress to do whatever it wants to supposedly defend itself. Defend itself against whom? No Arab country threatens it. It's got nuclear weapons, for God's sake. And we know, as the North Koreans have shown, that the one effect nuclear weapons has is it prevents anyone from attacking you. I think that is important to remember. Who is going to attack Israel knowing full well it has nuclear weapons? Which country wants to be wiped out? The Israelis are quite capable of using them of any country in the world today. So the question boils down to are the Israelis going to offer any concessions to the Palestinians, serious concessions, that would enable the Palestinians to live in dignity? The Palestinians would even be prepared not to have an army, just a police force. The answer is no. They want to create Bantustans, which can't even communicate with each other, but when they want to communicate with each other, have to do so via Jerusalem. Tel Aviv or whatever. That's the situation. It's a horrific situation. And in Europe, by the way, every time an opinion poll is taken, almost <coughs> every time over the last 10 years, when citizens are asked, which is the country you regard as the biggest danger to world peace, the reply comes Israel. In the United States, by and large, people don't even know what's going on in Israel. Recently, over the last 12 to 15 months, the New York Times has taken to publishing the odd op-ed piece. Not too regularly, but they do publish some stuff. So, what it will change the situation here, I think, is a new generation of young Jewish people whose basic loyalty is to the United States of America, who see themselves basically as Americans and not tied to the Israelis. Opinion polls are stressing that this is the case, that many opinion polls have said that young people of Jewish origin are saying they don't feel any loyalty to uh, Israel, they don't want to be identified with it, and this is creating some problems amongst the elders of APAC and others, saying how the hell are we going to reverse this, because it's in the medium term, it's a bit of a disaster. Uh, so that is, that is uh, effectively what's going on. The notion that there's an equivalence between the Israelis and the Palestinians? Mm -hmm. Come off it. What is the equivalence between a colonial power and a colony? There's no difference. And it does rule Palestine like a colony. Ask people, just go and live there and ask people. Some of the best Israelis are leaving the country. They can't bear it anymore. But everyone knows that except people in the United States who want to keep their eyes shut. That's what's going on. They want to ban the BDS movement, who don't even want to have this subject discussed. Better not to know. Better to keep our eyes shut. Otherwise, we might have to take awkward decisions. I was wondering what went wrong in 1991 in the Soviet Union. Uh, would Gorbachev have been better than Yeltsin slash Putin? And it took a right wing direction then. And uh, I, I share a couple personal vignettes. So a friend of mine visited Eastern Europe and visited Cuba, found out that Eastern Europe was occupied territory, unhappy. In the, in the 80s, whereas Cuba was a genuine revolution and people were happy. 
Uh, and, and the peace movement friends of mine visited the Soviet Union and found that they did not believe their government when they talked about our unemployment and homelessness in America. So I think they just did not believe our government, and maybe that's why the right-wing result happened in 91. Um, I think 91 took everyone by surprise, including Gorbachev. And I think the interesting thing about that is that there wasn't a big movement from below. Large numbers of Soviet citizens were shell-shocked that it had happened, but they had not participated in it. This was a movement at the very top. The United States was certainly taken by surprise. Uh, by what happened in Russia in 91, before they got into the act and started molding Yeltsin, which didn't work. So, uh, you know, I don't know what point you're making, but there was again a huge debate that took place in Russia in the late 80s, which I was privileged to participate in, on the future, on what socialism was. People were discussing it, and again, what, when you talk to people, and what Gorbachev himself said is, we don't want to return to capitalism in any shape or form. What we want is a more radical version of Scandinavian social democracy. I mean, that was, given what was going on, was a slightly utopian exercise. But nonetheless, that is what they wanted, and that is what would have made a lot of people happy. Socialism, or social democracy with a human face. And that they couldn't deliver because by that stage neoliberalism was in full flow, and as Jeffrey Sachs has said, we went in and wrecked that country by giving them completely wrong advice. That is what happened there. It's, um, okay, one more question, and then I think we have to stop. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, and loud. I'm concerned about, uh, in this country, the division um, of people who are left of center. So just to put in categories like the mainstream Democrats who supported Hillary Clinton versus uh, the progressives who supported Bernie Sanders. And I'm um, sort of thinking about maybe even like Germany before uh, you know, Hitler took power and there were all leftists and they were fighting each other. So I was just wondering if you had anything to say about that. Well, I, I've said it throughout my speech that I think what would be a great thing is to have a progressive political party in the United States well to the left of the Democrats in which everyone can participate without, which agrees, has a minimum program of six or seven points, finds agreement on them, which must include the United States and is, as an imperial power. I notice movements springing up on everything under the sun, but not a single anti-imperialist movement yet. Mm -hmm. Apart from the demonstrations against the Iraq war, which were very big in this country as well, but after people failed, they thought they might actually stop it, which was foolish, but they thought they would, which, you know, they tried to do. People went back and never came out again. And the fact that between a million and a million and a half Iraqis have died in the occupation, and that NATO's bombing, six months of bombing, killed at least 30,000 Libyans. These figures are written off. They don't matter. People don't think about them. Well, that's happening out there. They are Arabs, you know. They misbehave. We have to go and sort them out. This is the attitude, obviously not amongst progressive people, but in general. And it's not a good thing. So what this country is, an empire, weakened but not far from dead, uh, is doing in other parts of the world, you have to take this on board. It's not isolated from what they do at home. And this is the big lesson from the 60s, which the anti-war movement here, and all those brave and courageous soldiers who fought in Vietnam and came out against the war have taught us. And we at least owe it to them not to forget Thank you very much.